Good morning and welcome to the Gibbs Flash Forum. It is my singular pleasure this morning to welcome one of the most important leaders in society in our time. I am privileged to be joined in conversation for the next 45 minutes with the Group Chief Executive Officer of ESCOM, Mr. Andre Dureta. Mr. Dureta had the singular privilege of obtaining his MBA at a very beautiful uh, school in the Netherlands, Neenreude. Um, and I, I, I took a team of our executives there a while ago, and it is a really beautiful place. But I know he's also had the single pleasure of interacting with us here at Gibbs, first in his time at Sassol, and, and over the years as well at his time at NAMPAC. And we look forward to continuing to partner with uh, Mr. Dureta as part of his work in really wrestling the challenge, wrestling the beast that is ESCOM into restoring it to its former glory, to a time when it was an exemplar institution as one of the best energy providers in the world, not just in, on the continent in the world. And we know today he stepped in where very few were brave to step in on the 6th of January, 2020 in a life pre-COVID and, and he has navigated this institution for almost the past 14 months to where we are today. The purpose of our conversation today is not to focus on what you can find either at the Zonda Commission or to focus on what you can find uh, in the uh, general media, but to encourage uh, Mr. Dureta to bring us, bring us into his confidence to have a better understanding about how he and his colleagues at ESCOM and navigating this really important challenge. Welcome, Andre. Thank you very much for that introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, it's great to be back uh, with Gibbs. Uh, as you said, it's, it's been uh, a long association for me personally with Gibbs and it's always a pleasure to, to interact with your, your esteemed business school. Lovely. Thank you, Andre. So uh, given the limited time and just to uh, forewarn the, 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 the people that are watching, you're more than welcome to post questions on the chat and I will weave your, your questions into our discussions with Andre. Um, and, but in the meantime, I will kick off. Andre, in, at the, in the third quarter of last year, um, ESCOM published its integrated report. And on that integrated report on the cover page, the theme is restoring trust. Um, and obviously this is an important topic, the idea of restoring trust in an institution and of an institution that is crucial to the sustainability and the survival and success of this country. So let me begin there and ask you, how do you restore, how do you rebuild trust in an organization to us that looks like it's impossible to save? I think that's a that's a great question, and it underlies a lot of what we are trying to do from a cultural perspective. It's clear that Eskom has a trust deficit with South Africa. It's clear that Eskom has a trust deficit with its shareholder. It is clear that uh, Eskom has a trust deficit with its customers, and also internally uh, amongst our employees, we have a trust deficit. So restoring that, I think, is is fundamental to restoring. Eskom as an organization. Uh, Peter Drucker said, uh, culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast and I'm a firm subscriber to that. But having said that, I think we should also acknowledge that, that changing culture is far more challenging than changing uh, uh, the corporate strategy of any entity. So we have um, embarked on, first of all, resuscitating our corporate values. I very firmly believe that a values-driven organization is what uh, differentiates between a, a successful organization and an organization that, that uh, chases short-term profits, but ultimately fails uh, when it comes to uh, making sure that it is a sustainable situation. So I think for, for any business to be uh, a sustainable organization, you need to chase two objectives. You need to chase profitability. And I think we should not apologize for wanting to be a profitable organization. But secondly, you should uh, chase uh, 
the element of sustainability. And I think that that is immensely important. So um, resuscitating the values and driving the values has been a key focus area of what I've, I've tried to do. And we reference the values uh, at all times in our, in, our, in our conversations. Secondly, I think we have tried to restore trust by doing two things. The first thing is that we have implemented uh, consequence management. So that's the negative side of the coin. We have uh, stepped up disciplinary procedures. We have helped people to account for performance or lack thereof, uh, which hasn't been popular. Uh, you know, when, when you have an organization that is beset with inertia, uh, energizing people and getting them back into motion uh, does, does require a bit of effort. But on the positive side, we have been trying very hard to flag some of the excellent work that is being done by ESKIM, uh, pretty much unrecognized, I have to say, throughout the country on a daily basis. We, we have some truly, truly exceptional people working for us. And I've got a weekly engagement with um, some of our colleagues. I've got a platform, a media platform called Advice for Andre. And I readily accept that I require advice and I require good advice and lots of it. And I'm fortunate to be able to tap into the knowledge of uh, some really exceptional people in, in Eskom who, who tell me how we can do things better. And I learn a lot from those engagements and I find them very energizing because it tells me how people at grassroots level are passionate, they're excited, they're committed, and they really want to make uh, an effort to turn Eskom around. And doing both, I believe, um, translates into catching people doing things right. I think uh, Eskom's gone to a lot of trouble trying to catch people doing wrong. And I think that's right and it's and it's proper and it's how it should be done but we also should spend a similar amount of effort on catching people doing things right and then publicizing it so we've uh, stepped up our communication uh, unfortunately COVID prevented many face-to-face -face, uh, engagements that we would have liked to enter into but uh, by and large we have uh, really stepped up uh, the communication we've we've uh, revitalized or, or uh, started publishing again our staff newsletter that, that uh, disappeared somewhere along the line. And it's a really great and exciting read. Um, and therefore, I think communicating, energizing, recognizing, uh, those have been um, key focus areas of mine leading this yeah. organization. So, um so I, you, you may not be aware, but my PhD was in the field of trust and distrust. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic for me. And, and I know that you can address this either from a behavioral perspective, and then that speaks to your values of integrity amongst others, for example. But you also can discuss it from a competence perspective. Now, coming from the University of Pretoria, as we both are, and also uh, as the University of Pretoria is the largest supplier of engineers in the country, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one in three engineers walking in South Africa comes from the University of Pretoria. So what I've learned since I'm speaking to the Dean of um, Engineering Built Environment and Technology is that it takes more than the four years of doing an undergraduate degree. You still have to go and do effectively your practicals. So it takes about eight years to produce a really good engineer with a certified and I, I raise this because I want to focus on competent aspects of ESCOM. Given the, the high numbers of people that you've lost over the years, uh, uh, and then the numbers that you've had to release or got rid of for a variety of reasons for corruption and so forth, fixing their behavioral stuff, help us to understand from a competency assessment perspective, where does ESCOM sit? Because I think it's a bit like a pilot in a plane. I want to know that I'm being, lay, I'm being flown around by experienced pilots. And similarly, we want to know that we are being provided energy by experienced engineers. So where is the competence level of ESCOM as we speak today in 2021? Yeah, I think um, we, we have um, very highly qualified people. 
So Eskom has invested over the years in a number of bursary schemes, training programs, that's resulted in a remarkable concentration of uh, engineers in particular with master's degrees, PhDs. So we've got highly qualified people. The challenge, however, and the differentiation between an academic with respect, and I, and I fully <laughs> recognize whom I'm addressing here. <laughs> Even a um, disrespect is fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that when you run a major industrial corporation, what you want are people who can walk next to a turbine and say, it's time for us to, to look at the balancing on this turbine, just by listening to the machine. And that's a, that's, a, that's a deep level of experience that comes from many, many years of working in a power station, for example. Uh, there are other examples of we are uh, requiring people to um, have practices in place to walk their conveyor belts, for example. You, you, you will know from media reports that we've had a number of issues with conveyor belts. Now, this is a singularly unglamorous activity you need to go and walk next to a conveyor belt that 99% of the time runs smoothly, but it's to catch that 1% that, that, you, that you want to be there and understand exactly what you need to prevent. So we've implemented an operations excellence program. We've identified experts uh, in nine different areas, ranging right from uh, coal going into the power station to emissions and ash being evacuated from the power station and everything in between. And we have identified experts in ESCOM. So again, we, we are doing this on a, on a low cost basis. We, we don't have money to waste or money to burn. Um, and we are leveraging these pockets of excellence to identify best practice uh, across the organization and then roll it out so that we can learn from each other. Uh, and this is uh, an, an exciting program, and I think there's a lot of appetite because in transferring knowledge, you empower and you uh, create an environment where people can learn in a non-threatening manner. There's, a, there's a, uh, I think, a, a school of thought that uh, says in a situation where you're in crisis, you should uh, adopt the S1 type of leadership. So, you know, pull out the big stick and tell people this is how you do it. But a far more sustainable um, and long term solution is to educate people to appreciate why you're doing it and what you need to look for. So, this Operations Excellence Initiative, I'm, I'm very excited about it. And I really think that that's going to get the ideal marriage between our undoubted academic qualifications and accelerating the learning curve with practical experience that uh, we get our skills levels up to the required levels. So I, I'm going to take from that, that in addition to the various activities and projects that you have identified uh, with respect to the competence you are suggesting that you're comfortable that ESCOM has the requisite competence to address the challenge facing it. Is, is that correct? Um, and, 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 and yeah, so let me pause there because I've got a question from the audience uh, that, that, that maybe can help you to understand how much work is required of ESCOM management uh, to convince its key stakeholders out there of the progress, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So, so to answer your question, absolutely, we've we've uh, we've got the skills, uh, but not all of our people are at the requisite skill level. So, the challenge is how do we transfer that knowledge uh, from these pockets of excellence to make it um, into a process that elevates the entire organization to a higher level of skill. Lovely. So there's a, a person called Sharon Carson who's saying hi to you, Andre. I don't know if you know Sharon. And, no. and um, she, she says much has been said about ESCOM's pro profitability uh, and there's much to be admired. However, uh, she she's, remains concerned about the cost uh, formula 
and, and in cost and incentive formula. And she's not persuaded that ESCOM is doing enough uh, to deal with a, an, over, an overstaffed, a bloated staff complement. And, and I, I wonder, uh, in the spirit of rebuilding trust, whether you can take us into confidence about um, how is ESCOM addressing the staffing levels, which uh, I think we've read in the past have been at excessive levels based on a World Bank report, for example. And I know this is a very difficult subject given the relationship with the unions as well. So I'm asking it with appropriate sensitivity. Um, and, and so how, what progress are you making in addressing, in getting ESCOM to the sustainable level of, of staff that you desire over the next three to five years? Yeah, so uh, first of all, the, the the World Bank report that that suggested that Eskom was was overstaffed by some fifteen thousand uh, employees. I think that that has been rebutted. Uh, it it uh, used uh, benchmarks to uh, compare Eskom against that weren't appropriate and weren't entirely relevant. So with uh, with a lot of respect for the World Bank, I think the number that got put out there created this this perception that you know we had two to three people per uh, job in ESCOM. Uh, and and that, is, that is not true. We, we think that an appropriate level will be at about uh, 38,000 employees, given the size and scale of our operation, bearing in mind that we run uh, generation transmission distribution. And then we've also got a very large uh, engineering services company, ERI Rotec, so uh, 38,000 employees, that is our target number. We're currently sitting at about 44,000. Uh, when I joined, we were at 46,000. So uh, using natural attrition, as well as a series of uh, uh, voluntary severance packages, we've been able to uh, work that number down. And we are on a glide path down to the 38,000 without having to resort to uh, section 189 retrenchments. Uh, we think that this is an ideal balance where we can maintain appropriate skills levels. Obviously, you don't want your best people to leave. Uh, so there's a, there's a requirement, particularly with the voluntary severance packages, that uh, if the skill is required by ESCOM, then we are not going to uh, allow you to take a package uh, because the interests of the employer have to come first. And uh, therefore, I think, um, we should be in a position uh, by around about um, 2024, we, we have reached our target level in a structured, uh, compassionate and caring way without resorting to large scale retrenchments with all of the attendant risks and upset that that can create. Lovely. So I hope even Bulelani and Makunga will, will be happy with that. Let me focus on um, one of your values um, the value of customer satisfaction. And, and um, allow me to ask this question, how do you, taking that value into consideration, how do you go about building trust with end user customers like myself in a context of the twin problems of uh, inconsistent supply on the one hand and rising costs and uh, the latest NERSA ruling suggest that we continue on the trajectory of that rise in costs. Of course, that's gonna help your balance sheet, um, but it's gonna come at the expense of our balance sheet. So how do you persuade us that this is the right thing, given we are already coming off a broken trust relationship between the consumer and ESCOM? So first of all, um, customer satisfaction. Ideally, ESCOM should be invisible. Uh, we should not feature in people's minds. You should switch on the lights without a pause for thought. Uh, you should not worry about whether the lights are going to come or, on or not. It, it should just be there. So we should be an invisible utility because our level of service is so good that there is no need for you to think twice about uh, the service that you're getting. So that's, that's my aspiration is to become invisible as it were. Uh, from, a, from a customer complaint perspective. I get lots of customer complaints uh, daily into my inbox. Um, I don't uh, particularly like dealing with them because it reflects poorly on us, but we do deal with them and we do try and uh, uh, dispatch them as quickly as possible. And I think we, we have 
uh, hopefully set an example that customers matter. Customers are very important and we need to look after our customers. Now, um, electricity is a grudge purchase. It's a bit like buying petrol. Nobody likes to go into a, um, a service station and fill up his or her tank. It's, it's, it's not something that fills you with excitement at the prospect of, of, of doing so. Let's, let's understand that electricity is a grudge purchase. But let's also understand that compared to international benchmarks, South Africa's electricity pricing, and in particular Eskom's electricity pricing, is woefully behind where it should be. Uh, you know, lots of people are talking about uh, Eskom's power is now so expensive that they want to contemplate moving to Portugal. Well, um, our uh, household price uh, is about uh, 1 rand 90 per kilowatt hour. In Portugal, it's more than double that, just to, just to give you a benchmark. Um, so unfortunately, in order to enable Eskom to be financially self-sustaining, the tariffs need to increase. And it's a simple choice between continuing to rely on taxpayer subsidies, which distort the priorities of the fiscus. We take money away as Eskom from school feeding schemes, from uh, vaccine programs, from new roads. So um, one, one has to ask, is it economically appropriate that instead of recovering money from the um, end user who has discretion on whether or not to use it uh, and rather take money away from other government priorities. So if there is a choice to be made by the customer on how much electricity is consumed and how efficient you are in using electricity, um, we believe that that's, that's, that's appropriate. A very last remark on this, and it relates to municipal tariffs. Bear in mind that about half of the electricity that we sell is sold uh, through municipalities and municipalities add a markup on top of the Eskom tariff. And some of those costs are justified. Uh, municipalities have to run their own transformers and substations, billing systems, distribution and so forth. But in some instances, the markups are um, quite steep, uh, up to 161%. Uh, and we don't think that that is appropriate. We don't think that that is something that uh, we uh, should accept. And that is maybe an area where uh, consumers who are hard pressed can interrogate uh, using their democratic processes, the, the, the tariffs charged by the, um, by the municipalities and the local authorities. So Andre, um, I'm going to move now, uh, maybe less from the leadership question around trust, more towards the energy mix around strategy, but allow me to use this comment as a bridge. So I've heard this argument that you're making around the cost of electricity uh, per kilowatt hour at, at my end compared to my counterpart that's in Portugal, in mm. Turkey, in the UK, and so forth. The difference, though, is that electricity at that end Part of what's driving, from what I understand, the cost differential is the energy mix, right? Where we have a scenario where our energy mix is highly dependent on a cheap source of energy being coal compared to the, the, the let's say, the global north's energy mix, which only really uses coal in winter as a supplementary um, energy source and relies on a, a variety of different types of energy mixes. Mm -hmm. And so it, it would be useful to understand on a like for like basis, uh, what is the true cost as opposed to on an aggregated portfolio basis because the portfolios are not the same. Right? So that's something we can think about and maybe you could help us to understand in time because I don't think we've got the time to maybe unpack that in this session. Um, but help us to understand where is ESCOM now in terms of its energy mix, because I think most of us, when we think of ESCOM, I see one of the calls here uh, uh, from one of the comments, and I will tell you from whom, it's from a gentleman called uh, Sichaba Sidibe. He's really interested in the Waterberg coal fields. I wonder if he's got an interest in the Waterberg coal fields. <laughs> um, so I know that the, the many of us, when we think about energy, we think about those conveyor belts and coal, but mm. surely, 
uh, there's much more than that. Where are we in our energy mix? And, and how is this starting to influence sustainability of supply and potential give us directionality of price? And so um, Eskom turned 98 years old yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, so that's, that's, that's quite a milestone. And I think when Eskom was established, uh, the thinking at the time was that we would deliberately as a country use cheap electricity using cheap coal as a feedstock to drive industrial activity. And I think by and large, uh, for decades, this was a feasible and very workable approach. What has happened in the interim, though, is that the energy world has changed around us. So Eskom today sits with a fleet of um, power stations that are uh, on average 39 years old. They've had a hard life. They've not been well maintained. And the consequence of that is that uh, they are becoming increasingly expensive. Uh, many of them were also built at a time when environmental regulation and legislation was far less stringent than it is today. And we are therefore required to spend up to 300 billion rand over the next decade uh, in order to make our power stations become compliant with emission uh, regulations. And if we want to keep on operating those, then, then that is what we need to do. Now, what has happened is that there's been an absolute revolution in the energy technology field with the cost of wind and solar coming down exponentially uh, to the point where it is now more than competitive with uh, certainly new build coal. Uh, and in addition, of course, the uh, climate change imperative is putting more and more pressure on uh, trying to uh, borrow money to support a coal burning utility. Uh, we have seen a number of announcements from financial institutions, from insurance companies, saying that they are no longer going to lend money to a uh, new coal project, uh, and some are even saying they're not going to invest in any CO2 emitting uh, source. So uh, there is a context here that we that we need to understand. Added to that is that the cost of coal is no longer cheap. Uh, when you build a power station, you build it as close as possible to uh, the best possible coal reserve. And that just makes economic sense when you do your NPV calculation, which this audience will be very familiar with. You try and optimize your cash flows during the early part of the project because 30 years out, it becomes somebody else's problem. Now, that somebody else's problem has now become my problem. And <laughs> we are therefore faced with a situation where the coal mines are far away from the original mines because the resource has been mined out. Coal is by definition a, a wasting resource. So we have to incur more transportation costs. Um, we, we only have uh, three power stations that are linked solely to one mine. Uh, the others uh, all have to import coal to greater or a lesser extent from other sources. So that's why you see all of these trucks and trains uh, going around the country transporting coal. And that all costs a lot more money. So having said all of that in response to your um, uh, participant who's interested in the water boat, we will be a large consumer of coal for a long period of time. But as our power stations reach their end of life, we will um, put them into retirement. We are working very actively on a program to repurpose and to re-energize them using a combination of uh, PV, wind, and natural gas uh, in order to use the existing infrastructure and in order to abate some of the environmental compliance expenditure. We would rather spend that 300 billion on putting in place new generation capacity that does not require environmental abatement than to spend it on um, something that does not add one uh, megawatt of additional generation capacity. So that's the thinking. We are on the cusp of uh, an energy transition. We are trying our best to make this uh, transition just 
uh, we understand there are concerns from the coal mining fraternity and from people involved in the coal value chain. And uh, we are working hard to address those very, uh, very legitimate concerns. So I'm, I was reliably informed by an engineer, uh, given that I'm not an engineer, uh, um, that we, we, we are stuck in the negative jaws of power generation. On the one hand, we have, as you said, many old power stations that either need to be repurposed or retired. And then on the other, we have a few new power stations. And sadly, both perform similarly, i.e. old ones have, are prone to break down due to their age. New ones are prone to break down also due to the, the liability of newness. And we don't have much in the way of uh, the more stable in the middle range, so to speak. Which suggests to me that we need to get used to the notion of interrupted power supply as a way of life for a lot longer than perhaps has been communicated to us. Is that a good interpretation or am I misreading my uh, Saturday afternoon engineering conversation with a colleague of mine? No, I think um, we, we, we should contextualize uh, the challenge that we face. Um, when I joined in January of last year, uh, at my very first uh, system update briefing, I, I said to the South African public, uh, we need to do maintenance. We, we need to take uh, a larger than normal number of units out on maintenance, and that is going to increase the risk of load shedding. So, so that, that, that um, advance warning was given. It's uh, conveniently forgotten by Absolutely. a number of commentators, <laughs> but, but that's, that's entirely to be expected. Yeah. So um, we have embarked on this reliability maintenance recovery program, which seeks to restore some of the integrity of our generation system. And that will lead us to a position where we will, by the end of April this year, uh, see a step change in the reliability of our generation system. And then by September of this year, we should see um, the risk of load shedding pretty much uh, reduced, but not entirely eliminated. So, so there will always be a residual risk. And that is why we have been advocating and indeed supporting the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy's procurement program to add some 11.8 gigawatts of capacity to the grid on an expedited basis. And we, we, we think that this is exactly the right thing to do. Uh, we, we are working with the DMRE to enable this, to facilitate this. And um, we have a period of time during which uh, we are managing the risk to the system in uh, as responsible a way as possible. But as soon as this additional capacity gets put onto the grid, uh, we, we think that the, the risk of load shedding will be something of the past. So therefore, there's, there's an imperative here to procure this additional capacity as soon as we possibly can, even while we fix, first of all, our current system. Uh, you made reference to some of the design uh, defects that we've encountered at Madupi and Kusile. These are being addressed. And Madupi, I have to say, uh, the last month or so has been performing exceptionally well, which uh, suggests that we have got our arms around these design defects. And uh, that will give us a, a strong um, base on which to build a strong foundation uh, as we segue from our old coal-fired power stations into these new forms of uh, generation that are being procured as we speak. So I'm going to refer to a, 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 some comments and paraphrase them uh, from Paul Wingiri. Um, who's interested in ESCOM's uh, uh, terminating or modifying its supply agreements with countries outside of South Africa, which ESCOM supplies. So I want to locate it in the context of still, as we exit this energy mix questions, in the context of energy mix, because uh, importation of energy is part of the energy mix. We know, for example, 
I think we export about, uh, is it 8,000 uh, megawatts um, into our grid, and but we export uh, uh, an even bigger amount. So uh, I stand corrected. So my sense is the 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 South Africans are nerve are uncomfortable about uh, our net import or net export balance, if I can call it that, around energy. And then, of course, I can imagine our clients now speaking as South African suppliers, our clients uh, are also nervous about our strategy around our exporting of the, the product to the likes of Zimbabwe, Namibia, et cetera. So what, how, how are you helping uh, South Africans understand the import and export balance of energy as part of the broader energy mix? But so I think, uh, first of all, to mention that, uh, like other countries, uh, Eskom is part of an integrated regional transmission grid. So the um, uh, South African power pool, as it's known, is a mechanism for trading electricity across borders. Uh, this is an important regional role that uh, we play, but also that our sister utilities in um, other countries play as well. Bear in mind that we are, for example, dependent on significant uh, power purchases from Mozambique. Uh, so we are, we, we are not only exporting electricity, we are also importing electricity. And that is consistent with international practice that, that you will find um, in, in most other regions. So um, the the export of electricity is uh, not done at the expense of South African customers. So there's a narrative that uh, you know we we keep on supplying electricity to Zimbabwe uh, at uh, no cost while we inflict load shedding on South Africa, and that's just not true. Uh, that is just not accurate. Uh, we Zimbabwe have had payment. Um, issues in the past, we have now gone to them and we said, okay, we are going to treat you like um, any domestic customer. Uh, we're going to switch you to prepaid, so you better pay upfront for electricity. And that's worked remarkably well, and they've also paid back uh, the debt that was due to Eskom. Uh, the, the, the only outstanding uh, doubtful debt that is still there is with Mozambique, with, with EDM, and that is in the process of being resolved. But there is no way that we will um, disadvantage uh, South Africa and our South African customers uh, in order to keep the lights on in Zimbabwe and in Zambia. Uh, we make money, um, and by making that money, by exporting electricity, we actually uh, subsidize South African electricity sales, so that puts a damper on the cost of electricity that we sell domestically. Thanks, Andrew. I think that's actually an important point to make that um, while some countries are islands, we are not an island. We are part of an ecosystem, a connected ecosystem. And just like with the COVID response, it's not enough for South Africa to get uh, its COVID act together and the rest of our neighbors not getting because we are then going to suffer the consequences. And likewise, we, we have a moral responsibility um, uh, but also strategic responsibility to, to ensure that our neighbors are equally supplied. And I think it's an important point that is often lost on, on, on people. I see we've got five minutes left, so I wonder if I could uh, jump into maybe at a personal level. Uh, uh, and here I'm also inspired, I don't know if it's by Mark Barnes himself or somebody who calls himself anonymous att attendee, <laughs> and, and say, help us to understand um, a year in the life of a corporate person uh, joining the public service is not an easy one. Um, how has it been, Andre? Um, many of us uh, can't imagine ourselves leaving uh, the corporate world to go and join a public sector, particularly in a troubled organization like ESCOM. What kind of support have you obtained from, from uh, the political um, uh, principles, so to speak, and, and what kind of support do you have in your engagements with broader stakeholder groups that have an interest in the success of ESCO? Um, look, I think, um, first of all, joining 
the public sector from the private sector um, has, has come with uh, some adjustments that I've had to make. I think the, the speed of decision making is not as fast as one would be accustomed to. Uh, ESCOM, like other state-owned enterprises, is regulated by the Public Finance Management Act, uh, which is, um, I think, uh, a piece of legislation that, that, that may um, require some updating to make it more suitable for the management of a 24-7 industrial uh, corporation. And uh, that, therefore, um, slows us down a bit in, in making uh, decisions as quickly as we would like to. But obviously, we're working with public money, so we have to uh, account to the public and make sure that, that, that we do so um, with due regard for the public purse. I think the, um, the political support that I've enjoyed has been strong. Uh, Minister Gordon is, is, a, is a tough taskmaster. He's, he's upset when there's load shedding and he calls me and he, he, he expresses his displeasure, which I'm sure he does on behalf of every South African. Uh, so, um, but by and large, I must say that, that, that the experience of navigating um, the political landscape has not been um, an overwhelming one or one that I, that I feel has sought to disable the turnaround of Eskimo. I think it's common cause amongst everyone except um, maybe some of the most obtuse that Eskom needs a change, Eskom needs a turnaround and therefore uh, the burning platform is sufficiently visible that uh, I've, I've got the support that I need to do the job. So if you think about your turnaround activities, let's say in Europe, your turnaround activities in China, and, and some of your turnaround activities of NEMPAC, for example, what makes ESCOM stand out? Uh, given you, part of the reason I think you were selected is largely because of your turnaround expertise. So what has been different at ESCOM in the, in the past year? I think scale. Um, ESCOM is a very large organization. As I said, 44,000 employees, um, power stations all over the country, um, thousands and thousands of kilometers of transmission grid, uh, 6.3 million electricity uh, consumers, which gives you uh, an idea of, of just how large and complex this organization is. And um, the larger an object is, the greater the inertia. Uh, that's, that's what uh, Newton taught us. And that's very true also of the corporate world. And therefore, uh, getting that inertia going, I think, is, is one of my big challenges. Uh, I think we, we are building up the momentum. I, I, I see change accelerating. I see people engaging with an ESCOM and, and uh, doing the right things on a daily basis. So that's, that's encouraging and it's positive. Um, and uh, certainly I'm, I'm optimistic that, that this is doable. Uh, and that we can turn Eskimo around. Andre, we've reached our hard stop of 9.45. I wish to take this opportunity to thank you for once again, as always, being open and frank with us on the Gibbs platforms. And we look forward to engaging with you again, possibly later in the year, around October, November, uh, once we've seen more progress, particularly around April and September. Those are two key dates that you mentioned that we think are important in the spirit of rebuilding trust. And so without further ado, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.